All right, let's talk about these West Coast Eagles. Since my Eagles were bundled out in a heartbreaking elimination final against the Pies last weekend, I've had plenty of people asking for my response. Now, we did do a six-hour live stream doing the Eagles and Collingwood game and, of course, the Saints and Bulldogs game earlier that day, so plenty of people would have seen my live reaction to that game anyway. If you do go back and watch it, you can see I'm fairly composed for a side that's just lost one of the absolute games of the season. But the reason for that is just because I don't think us getting eliminated in week one this year has really cost us too much. In other words, realistically, I just think the Eagles were that far off the actual top four teams and the top four contenders this year that it really just saved us from a semi-finals loss the following week to Geelong, just like last year. Now, a team's performance in finals can obviously inflate or deflate the perception of their year as a whole. I remember in 2017, we were a very, very average football club in our last two games of the year. We beat the first place Adelaide Crows, and in the first week of the finals, we knocked Port Adelaide out after the siren, and the way we reflected on that season was probably that it was a bit of a success. By contrast, this year, we went 12-5, and and we lost week one of the finals, and this will be considered a major failure. The truth is, this team has been geared up for the here and now. You know, we traded in Tim Kelly last year for pretty much all the draft picks in the world, and uh, to come up short and lose in week one of the finals, it's obviously a really bitter result. It's interesting because on paper, in just raw wins and losses, you could say we had a pretty good year. We went 12-5 and five with two Queensland hub stints, and if you extrapolate that over a longer season, that's about 15-7, and seven, which is what we did last year. And 15-7 and seven quite often gets you top four. We just were unlucky this year in a sense that there was quite a competitive top four. Now, it was pretty razor-thin margins at the top this year. Obviously, if we had beaten the Dogs in Queensland when we were under the pump with injuries and obviously there was that controversial touch or, you know, earlier in the year if we'd actually showed up to play Gold Coast, just one more win and we would have had a double chance. And suddenly the perception around a top four finish is a lot better than playing an elimination final in week one. That being said, we probably would have played the Pies in a semi-final in Perth anyway. So we probably would have been bundled out of the finals in similar fashion anyway. So there's no real point reflecting too heavily on that. The crazy thing about the Eagles this year is that in August, I believe they were actually flag favorites, which was highly unjustified when you look at the season as a whole. But I think we went on that 7-0 run in Perth, playing some pretty good football to be fair, but we also did have it pretty easy. Our best win of the season by far was that tight battle against Geelong where we came from behind and won and the week before I think we just slaughtered Collingwood as well so within those two weeks the perception around the Eagles completely changed but if you break down the stats and I got this from on the couch it's not for great reading we were 14th in the comp across the year as a whole for generating inside 50s which is just putrid for a team that's meant to be contending but on the flip side we were the number one team for goals per inside 50. So we had a really efficient forward line. We just couldn't generate the supply. This again really speaks to a weak sort of midfield and perhaps an over-reliance on a really efficient forward line spearheaded by JK and Darling. And even though JK didn't have his best year for the entire year, he was still putting up goals fairly regularly. We weren't just relying on our forwards though. We were reliant on Nick Nat Nui. Incredibly, we had 19% of our total scores this year from center stoppages, and that is actually an all-time record, which really speaks to the dominance that Nick had. And it does make me think, if we didn't have Nick Nat Nui playing at this level, which we, to be fair, we've never actually had Nick Nat playing at this level before, and if we hadn't recruited Tim Kelly this off-season in light of those midfield injuries we had, we probably would have missed the finals. Look, we did what we could. We overcame a horrid start of the season in that first Queensland hub. We won all our games in Perth up until the finals. But realistically, if we're going to be a contending team going forward, we really do need to start fixing some of those numbers. Look, let's not overlook the positives this year. There were plenty. Nick Natanui obviously playing virtually the entire season and playing in the form he did. He's a very good chance to be our best and fairest this year. Like I said, we were probably a little too over-reliant on him, but he was still absolutely fantastic. Liam Ryan obviously reached new heights. He's actually playing to a level I didn't think he had in him. The growth from that player in the first three years of his career, even since year one and two, has been phenomenal, and it was a well and truly deserved All-Australian nomination this year. On top of that, Brad Shepard is a player who's been continually at a high standard for a number of years, finally got rewarded with an All-Australian recognition. And another defender, Liam Duggan, was surprisingly one of our best players this year. He's really made that halfback flank role his own, and you can really start to see him shape as potentially our next captain after Luke Shuey. We definitely had our high points this year as well with, in my opinion, our best win, or at least our most satisfying win, was against the Saints when we had virtually no one playing. We had about three guys with about five games experience in that midfield alone, and we somehow got the job done with Tim Kelly and Andrew Gaff putting on a masterclass. What we really have seen this year is an emergence of that next generation with those guys in their early 
20 is like Tom Cole, Jackson Nelson, Josh Rotham, Liam Ryan, as I said before, Liam Duggan, Jake Waterman, and even Oscar Allen as well. These guys were core contributors this year, which is really important for a list that is perceived as pretty old. All of the players that I just mentioned are on the right side of 25. We also tested out a fair bit of the list. I believe we had six debutants this year. They may not all have big futures with the West Coast Eagles, but in particular, Harry Edwards, O'Neill, and Bailey Williams are players I really think could have big futures at the Eagles, and we saw what they could do at AFL level. The negatives this season were fairly obvious, that first Queensland hub in the dewy conditions where our lack of ground ball game and contested game were really exposed, and this is a huge key area for us going forward. In particular, round two getting towelled up by a second gamer in Matty Rao was a bitter pill to swallow. On top of that, we saw with quite a few injuries to our midfield that we have no midfield depth or talent past guys like Mark Hutchings. Mark Hutchings usually be the first midfielder into the team, but he was injured for a large point of this year as well. I mean, we saw guys like Hamish Brayshaw get a game. Braden Ainsworth played in a final. When that's happening, in my opinion, that is a huge indictment in particular on our young midfield stocks. Another negative is that we've obviously kind of put all our chips in to contending for the here and now. And undoubtedly, we wasted another season with guys like Kennedy, Hearn, and Shuey and Redden over 30 and not getting any younger. So to answer the question of this video, where are the Eagles at right now? They're still in contention going forward, but they have two key areas of focus in my opinion. First of all, it's the complete lack of contested game and that midfield dynamic. So we obviously have on talent, one of the better midfields in the competition when we added Tim Kelly. When you add that to Elliot Yo, Luke Shuey, Jack Redden, Andrew Gaff, you think, gee, on paper, this team should be monstering other teams' midfields, especially when they got the service of Nick Natanui. But something's off with the dynamic in there. I don't know if you can simply blame the midfield coach, but for whatever reason, other than when Sam Mitchell was at the club, this has been a glaring weakness for us for the best part of a decade. And further to that, we seriously need to look at adding young midfield talent to this list. When you look at it in its entirety, that is the glaring hole. Now, because of the way we exited the finals with barely a yelp in week one, I'm expecting we might have a fairly aggressive offseason. There's only so much we can do, though. Our hands are a little bit tied. We've got no first round draft pick this year. I think we enter the draft at pick 30. I think we may actually have to keep our first round in next year because we haven't taken one since 2017. And on top of that, salary cap's got to be a bit of a squeeze at the moment with COVID-19 and the fact that we have an aging list. What I do suspect is we might cut a little bit of the dead wood. Will Schofield's retired after a great career, but he was clearly not going to be in future plans. Lewis Jetta, after a brilliant 2019 season, has fallen away badly, and he's clearly not in their plans, and it seems like he's out the door as well. Then you're looking at guys like Tom Hickey, who can't get a game at the moment, being chased heavily by Sydney. I don't know if he'd uproot himself and go away, but that may be a move that we'd have to consider. Now, unfortunately, we're in the shit position of this being a bad year to cut deep into the list with the uncertainty of the draft, and we have no first round draft pick, but ultimately, we are at the point where we could use a bit of refreshing of the list. For me, I've been a fairly decent advocate for the Eagles' young talent over the years, but for me, there are three crucial question marks. Our last two first-round picks, Jared Brander and Daniel Venables, currently sit outside the best 22. Jared Brander is a key forward slash key defender who's been turned into a wigman and played a little bit of midfield this year and frankly hasn't been able to settle into one role at AFL level. For me, he doesn't look like a natural wingman. He's got to play key position. But I'm looking at our list and between Jeremy McGovern and Tom Barras not really slowing down and the emergence of Harry Edwards and up forward, you've got Oscar Allen and Jake Waterman ready to replace JK. Where exactly does Brander fit into this team? He's another player that I think could be traded if the right deal came him up mostly from his own perspective if he is a young talented key position player and he wants to play key position games at AFL level the Eagles might not be the right club for him then you got Daniel Venables who in my opinion is a pretty talented player already a premiership player in fact who's missed a good year and a half due to a concussion I have no idea if this kid is going to come back and play AFL the chances are probably against him but if he does come back, he will add to a young midfield nucleus, which at the moment is looking pretty bare. So fingers crossed on that one, but who knows what to expect. And then further to that, there is Willy Rioli, and God knows again if this guy's going to play at AFL level again. But if you look at brand of Venables and Rioli all coming in and reaching their potential, suddenly this list looks a whole lot stronger. So to kind of conclude this rant, I believe this team is good enough, but we do need to make some aggressive moves just to freshen things up, and we desperately need to look at young midfield 
off-field talent. This may not be the year to do it, unfortunately, and it's shit to think that we might have to sit idle for a year or I'm not too sure what's going to happen. In an ideal world, we offload a few players, maybe get a chance to upgrade some draft picks, and we recruit some good young midfielders in this draft. Otherwise, we're looking in two to three years when Shuey and Redden have retired. We're going to have to be looking to bolster our midfield from other clubs. I'm looking at guys like Devin Robertson at the Brisbane Lions, Will Powell at the Gold Coast Suns, another player we were very keen on pre-draft who may be squeezed out of a very talented midfield. And then someone like a Nathan O'Driscoll who just comes to mind because he's going in this year's draft and he's West Australian. Overall though, it's good not to be too reactionary. I still think this team has the potential to recover and re contend again next year. At the end of the day though, it is not panic stations yet but we do need to be proactive in improving the list and the team dynamic where we can. As far as I'm concerned, there is no reason to think that this Eagles side can't contend next year. My optimistic hope is that we've got aging players reaching the end of their career who think 2018 might not happen again, and that really brings back that hunger and desire to achieve the same heights again. It looks like JK and Hearn are signing in for another year at least to play with this club. So maybe they believe we have what it takes to go all the way next year as well, and so do I. Thankfully, I believe to some extent we have replacements for guys like Kennedy and Hearn with your Allens, your Watermans, and then on top of that, your Duggins, Coles, and Rothams down back. But the glaring issue is replacements for Shuey and Redden in a couple of years. But for now though, all our chips are in contending for 2021. So let's back them in and hope they can do it again. Thanks for watching guys. If you're new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe. Go sub to my friend Druzy as well. Good up and coming YouTuber. And on top of that, go check out my other podcast, Cole World as well, where we talk about life and uh, well, that's pretty much it. Thanks guys. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.